I'm Marvin Polis from the City of Edmonton. With me this morning is Joshua Farley. He's the Associate Professor of Community Development and Applied Economics and Fellow of the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics at the University of Vermont. This morning, we're here to talk about environmental economics. So let's get started, Josh. First, tell me, let's begin by talking about what is it and how does it differ from traditional economics that we study in school? I'd like to distinguish between environmental economics and ecological economics. So environmental economics is really a sub-discipline of neoclassical economics, which is what most people understand when they think about economics and academia. And in neoclassical economics, it assumes that people are rational, they're selfish, they act in their own self-interest, and they're insatiable. We always want more. So the goal of neoclassical economics is to maximize the monetary value of economic output which also means maximizing economic output. We want to produce more and more, so we consume more and more forever. The basic approach is that the economy is the whole. It's the whole system. It's not a subsystem of anything else. Most neoclassical economists really ignore natural resource inputs and waste outputs, um, and they pretty much ignore the benefits we get for free from healthy ecosystems. Uh, they essentially assume that all production, everything comes from just capital and labor, the machines we make and our hard work. Um, and technology keeps improving our ability to produce with machines and labor. Um, natural resource economics and environmental economics, or is subdisciplines of neoclassical economics, actually do acknowledge that natural resources are required for production. Pollution is an output of production. Um, and they're increasingly paying attention to other benefits provided by ecosystems, often referred to as ecosystem services. But the goal of these disciplines is really to use those benefits from nature as efficiently as possible to maximize monetary value or its equivalent. So that, again, the goal is essentially more and more uh, consumption, although acknowledging that we also consume um, natural resources. And uh, they tend to view everything is substitutable. So if we run out of one natural resource or another, we'll always develop a substitute. I think the best uh, statement that illustrates this is uh, Thomas Schelling won the Nobel Prize in 2005. And he's an um, environmental economist focused on climate change. And he said that climate change really is not that important because it only affects agriculture. And agriculture is only about 3% of GNP. So if we lose one third of global agriculture, no harm done. We'll still achieve our economic growth goals by 2051, we, we otherwise would achieve by 2050. No food, no problem. There's substitutes for everything. That's, I think, a good example of their worldview. The goal of environmental and natural resource economists is to really integrate all natural resources, all environmental services into the economic system, just to create markets and everything. And what they really want to do is use these resources efficiently to maximize consumption. Ecological economics really takes it a completely different view. It looks at the economic system is a subsystem sustained and contained by the global ecosystem. It starts from the laws of physics. You can't make something from nothing. Everything the economic system creates uses raw materials and resources that come from nature. You need energy to do work. So we, everything we create uses energy, and the energy source mostly is fossil fuels. You also can't make nothing from something. So when we burn energy, we burn fossil fuels, or use raw materials from nature, Everything eventually returns to nature as waste. The biggie is the carbon dioxide waste from fossil fuels right now. Um, so we have a finite quantity of natural resources available. We have a finite quantity of fossil fuels available. And uh, we have to use these things very carefully to produce the services we want. It also looks at the laws of ecology. When we take these raw materials from nature, we chop down trees, we chop out forests, and we spew back waste, we degrade our ecosystems. And those ecosystems provide really important services to us. That There's no species that can survive without a healthy, functioning ecosystem. So the basic idea is the ecosystem structure, which is the raw material inputs to our economy, alternatively serve as the building blocks of ecosystems that generate functions. And those functions of value to people we call ecosystem services. And when you remove structure, you lose you lose function. When you spew waste, you lose function, and we need those functions to survive. Finally, ecological economics does look at the laws of economics, and the basic law of economics is that you stop doing something when the costs of doing more of it outweigh the benefits. And as we 
to have a bigger and bigger economy, each amount, each additional amount of economic production has less benefit to us. The first food we put on our plates is critically important. The houses we build for basic shelter are critically important. But as we have more and more and more bigger houses, bigger cars, the value goes down. There's less additional benefit from our fifth pair of shoes than from our first pair. So the bigger our economy grows, the less benefits we get. But the costs go up and up and up as we continue to spew more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, threatening agriculture. We chop down more and more forests, threatening the regulation and purification of water supplies, threatening other species. So the costs go up while the benefits go down. And when the costs exceed the benefits, it's time to stop. And uh, that's something that's not recognized by conventional economics that there's such a thing as enough and we need to stop growing our economy before we wipe out the ecosystems that sustain us. So the goal of ecological economics is really to adapt our economic system to ecological and physical constraints of our finite planet. Ecological economists also look at humans as very complex animals. We're not just about ever-increasing consumption. We're not just selfish and greedy. We care deeply about each other. We care about uh, relationships with each other. We care about the natural environment we live in. We have a whole complex range of goals besides ever-increasing consumption. So we focus on trying to provide a satisfactory quality of life for this and future generations. And to do that, there's kind of three critical things we need to achieve. First is ecological sustainability, because if we wipe out the ecosystem that sustains us, there is no future and no quality of life in the future. Second is a just distribution of resources. Because if you have somebody, you know, if some people don't have enough to feed their kids, they don't care about the future. And they're going to do whatever it takes to feed their kids today. And there's nothing, you know, we can't ask them to sacrifice their children's well-being for the benefits of future generations not yet born. And third, because we do have finite resources and we do have a lot of unmet needs, we've got to use those resources as efficiently as possible. So, you know, it's ecological sustainability, just distribution and economic efficiency are the goals of ecological economics, whereas conventional economics focuses really just on efficiency. So you're saying then that if we fail to consider the environmental capital, the human race makes silly decisions. The human race, race makes very, very silly decisions um, in a number of, uh, uh, in too many ways to count. But, um, you know, basically, for a long time, though, if you think about it, our econ economic system arose, you know, capitalism a couple hundred years ago. And back then, forests were abundant. The oceans were full of fish. There were very few problems with pollution. You know, there was no global climate change. So economics focuses on the use of scarce resources. Those resources weren't scarce. It didn't make a lot of sense to pay attention to them when they were super abundant. Things have changed an awful lot since then. Um, you know, 200 years ago, if you wanted more fish, the problem was not enough boats. If you wanted more trees, the problem was not enough saws. Now, if you want more fish, the problem is there's not enough fish. If you want more trees, the problem is there's not enough trees. You know, what things created by nature are now scarce, things created by humans are abundant. And the most critical scarcities are probably those services provided by nature, like climate stability, water purification, um, the reproductive capacity, providing us with food, fiber, fuel, you know, regulate atmospheric gases and all these critically important things that we tend to ignore in the past because they were abundant. Okay, so then how do we assign a value to things like clean air, clean water, fish in the ocean so that they aren't being consumed at a rate that's unsustainable? Well, and here's, here's one of the things. There's a lot of economists say, well, we want to assign a monetary value. And, um, and there's a lot of mechanisms, a lot of ways you can do it. Basically, the idea about a monetary value, it's, uh, you know, it's, people, the, it's the famous water diamonds paradox. Water is, un, you know, we, we die without it in a week. And uh, yet it costs almost nothing. Diamonds are, are, you know, incredibly expensive and have almost no, value, you know, real use value whatsoever. So a long time ago, economists recognized that what um, – a market economy focuses on is the exchange value, how much we can exchange. Um, so we won't give much for another glass of water right now because we already have plenty of water. So we don't really care about it. We'll give a lot of money for a diamond because we don't have much. 